Amen. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse number 46. And we will read through verse number 53. Luke 24, beginning at verse number 46. And reading through verse number 53. We stand today in honor of the reading of God's word. And the King James text today reads... And he, meaning Jesus, said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God Amen. Praise God. Amen. Father, we love you today so very much, and the Word of God is so valuable to our soul. It is today that blessed manna which has fallen from heaven that we might eat and not only be full but be satisfied. Master, today you placed a very powerful, very important word upon my heart. And I desire, Lord, today that you would anoint me in a special way. Help me, God, to this word in a manner that brings glory and honor to your name. Help me, God, today to remember every word that I ought to speak. And help me, Lord, not to speak that which is unnecessary. Let the word go forth with the love of God and the power of God, the authority of the Holy Ghost that the hearer might not only hear with their ear, but might receive with their heart. Change us, challenge us today. Help us, God, today to leave this place with this word engraved upon the tablet of our heart, that we might live it, not just hear it. Master, we ask all this in that blessed saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Let me turn myself down and somebody said amen. <laughs> Y'all think I don't know your, your little secret thoughts about me, you know. Amen. We live today in a very busy world. We're always in a hurry. We're always running from one task to the next. We can't even sit in church half the time, but that we've already got something planned for Sunday evening after the service is over. And that's just the way we live today, isn't it? We're moving from one task to the next. Every day of your life, you are on a schedule. You're always trying to meet deadlines. You're constantly going from one planned event or one planned chore to the next. And very seldom are you ever able, I don't know, maybe you're, maybe you're more able than I am, but very seldom are you able to just kind of sit down 
and settle in and relax a little. You know what I'm talking about? And just say, I'm good where I'm at. I'm good right here. I haven't got nowhere to go. I haven't got nothing to do. I'm good right here. I'll just stay here a while until I feel like doing something else. The passage that I read to you this afternoon that we read together, I should say, is a passage in the book of Luke that speaks of the Lord's ascension after his resurrection. He is speaking to his disciples and he explains to them some things. He said, you know, I told you when I was with you that everything must come to pass that was written in Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. I got news for you children. Jesus is the subject of the Old Testament. Hallelujah. He's as much the subject of the Old Testament as he is the subject of the Gospels. If you know what you're looking at, you'll see Jesus everywhere you look. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, even that old rock that Moses spoke to that gave forth water in the wilderness for the people of God. The Apostle Paul said Christ Jesus was that rock. Hallelujah. He's all through the Old Testament. Jesus is the burning bush. Jesus is the fiery pillar that led the people of God by day. And he is that pillar of cloud. That, or excuse me, the pillar of fire led him by night and the pillar of cloud that led him by day. If I did it vice versa, they might not have seen it either way. Amen. He is the tabernacle. He is the tabernacle. Oh, hallelujah. He is the tabernacle. He is every instrument. He is every part of that tabernacle. Every part of that represented the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, when you read the Old Testament, remember what he told some of the old religious Jews? <laughs> he said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. They are they that testify of me said, if you read your Bible right, if you read that scripture right, then you'll understand it's talking about me. Hallelujah. Whew. Then open to their understanding. See, you can't get a lot of things until God gives you the ability to get it. And God won't give you the ability to get it till you want to get it. As long as you, oh my goodness, as long as you think you got it, God can't give you the ability to get it. <coughs> See, there's a lot of people in the church today think they understand this thing we call the gay issue. They think they understand. They think they know what it's all about. They think they know why a person's gay. Because you're just swallowed up in lust, that's why. Because you got a devil, that's why. They've got all kind of understanding as to why people are LGBT. And boy, every one of them's negative. Every one of them paints people a devil, paints them evil and wicked. But you know what? They'll never know the truth about it. They'll never be able to understand it until they quit thinking they already understand it. Am I telling the truth now? Oh, there's a lot of things people think they understand today. And the truth of the matter is they're as ignorant as a brick. <laughs> the truth. They don't get it at all. But God cannot open your understanding until you decide you want to understand it. I'll tell you what happens that makes people suddenly want to understand it. That old Pentecostal preacher when his son comes home and says, Daddy, I'm gay. Ooh, boy, all of a sudden he wants to understand it. Oh, he thought he knew. All these years he's been preaching this hard, hateful, nasty, homophobic message. And guess what? All of a sudden now, there's a circumstance in his life that makes him look at things a little bit differently. It makes him realize, maybe I need to look at it again. Maybe, I, maybe Martin, I need to talk to the Lord about opening my understanding a little bit. I knew one young man who visited our church some years ago. I believe his name, if I remember correctly, was Michael. His daddy was a 
United Pentecostal preacher. And he said that when he first came out to his dad, his dad flat out rejected him and his mom. And they, you know, just didn't want anything to do with him. And he said a couple months later, his dad called him and said, son, come home. We need to talk. He's, he went to his parents' house to talk to them. And they said, we have taken the news of your orientation very hardly. And it has not been easy for us to deal with it, but we want to react and respond to everything that comes our way in a godly way, in the way God would have us to re react and respond. And we think maybe our early, earlier reaction wasn't quite the way God would have us to react. Said So the father said, a preacher of mine, he said, I went into the scriptures and I begged God, Lord, help me. To understand this issue. Help me to understand this. And that father for the first time in all his years of ministry. Began to look at this issue. And he began to do some research. And he began to do some digging. And he began to go back into the Greek. And he began to go back into the Hebrew. And guess what? He found out that what he thought he understood. He had no understanding of whatsoever. Amen. And he said I'm here to tell you son. That I have found that what I have been taught and what I have been teaching is not altogether accurate. Right. Oh my goodness. Who thank God for God's ability to open our understanding. Am I telling the truth Amen. today? See, the disciples had walked with Jesus. They had heard his teaching. They had experienced his miracles. They had seen his divinity laid out in front of their eyes. And they still didn't get it. Can you imagine? Yeah. Jesus said, more blessed are those that have not seen. You know, we look back and say, oh man, they were blessed. They got to see all this firsthand. They got to see it with their own eyes. Honey, be glad you didn't. Because if you had, you'd probably today still be an unbeliever. No, those of us who have not seen these things come to pass, but who later have had to rely upon the testimony of the writers of the New Testament, we have a complete and total record that we can refer to. We can literally sit and put all the pieces together in that puzzle. We can understand who Jesus is because we're not just looking at a flesh and blood man standing in front of us who has to use the restroom every once and again. Think about it. That'll surely knock you off the idea that he's God in the flesh real quick, won't it? When he says, excuse me, guys, I've got to use the latrine. Well, I can't be God. Why would God need to use a little tree? Am I telling the truth? Say, Pastor, you're so nasty. No, I'm not. I'm trying to make a very real, very legitimate point. When you see somebody that has to do everything humans have to do, <laughs> it's awful hard to understand them as being divine, isn't it? It's awful hard to understand them as having an origin in heaven. The Lord said, no, bless, more blessed are those who have not seen and who believe. Why? Because we've been given a complete record. We can read the Gospels, and we can read the epistles, which were the writing of the apostles, listen, after their understanding was opened. Aha! So we get to see how the apostles ran around blind as a bat, didn't get it, didn't understand it in the Gospels. But then when we started Romans, all of a sudden we begin to read the writing of the apostles. And this is all their writing after they finally got it. After the light was finally turned on. After their understanding was open. After their spiritual blindness was taken away. We've got more that we can investigate. We've got more information that we can put together and understand who Jesus was and what Jesus did and how he did it. We've got more today than anybody in the time of the Lord ever had. 
we got more than people going up through the 13th and 14th century had to understand him. But today I could go through this passage verse by verse. I could, you know, do a little exegesis for you of each and every portion of this passage. But that's not the intent of this message. This message today is, in fact, I promise you, a prophetic message. It is not a message that is meant only for those in this room, but it is meant for the entire church of the Lord Jesus Christ Worldwide, straight, gay, cross, out of blind. You need to hear and understand and listen to what this old preacher has to say today. There may be people listening today, Lisa, don't want to hear me because, well, I know something about you. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Well, that's your detriment. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but God's talked to me through a donkey or two. <laughs> if he can talk... To bail him through a donkey, he can talk to you through this jackass, okay? <laughs> Amen. So, it, you know, let me tell you, God don't need perfect people to speak through them. God don't need sinless people to speak through them. God don't need people who can walk on water to speak through them. He needs people who are willing to let him speak through them. Amen. No, in this passage, the Lord opens our understanding. He talks about things that have come to pass. He said, all these things were meant to be. All these things had to happen. He opens for understanding that they might understand the scriptures. By the way, you've, those of you that uh, have been part of this church for a while, you remember that in the New Testament, when you read the word scriptures, it not one time refers to the New Testament canon. Not one time. Whenever you read the word scriptures in the New Testament, it is referring specifically to the Old Testament. The Bible said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When that was written, there was already a canon of scripture that was known as scripture. It is what we today call the Old Testament. When Jesus said to the Jews of his day, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they that testify in me. He was not talking about the New Testament. No, the New Testament didn't exist. How are they going to search the scriptures when the scriptures, if it includes the New Testament, didn't even exist? How are they going to do that? No, when you read the word scriptures, the Bible said that when the scriptures were written, listen to me now, this is what, this is what the Bible tells us, holy men of old were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Isn't that what it says, Lisa? My little ordained <laughs> preacher over here, disciples of Christ, the Lord said, the word of God says, that the scriptures were given as holy men of old. So whenever you read the word scripture in the New Testament, it is referring to the Old Testament canon only. So the Lord's, the Bible tells us here, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Half of these disciples haven't, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John hadn't even written their Gospels, as the Lord is, is saying these words. They hadn't even begun to write their account of the Lord's life yet. So those, those books are not Scripture. Am I telling the truth? John hadn't had his vision yet. He hadn't written the book of Revelation yet. So guess what? That is not Scripture. No, Jesus opened their understanding because as Jews, they needed to understand who Jesus was and where Jesus was prophesied and what spoke of Jesus in the Old Testament. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Amen. We got a lot of people in the church today that try to apply attributes to the New Testament writing that are reserved by God for the Old Testament writing. Doesn't apply to the New Testament writing. Y'all don't mind, I took my jacket off, do you? No. Preacher gets hot. Whew, I get real hot fast. Amen. Listen to me now. Having heard all the Lord said and watching him prepare to ascend, the Lord Jesus Christ gives his 
disciples a command. He said, tarry ye, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Notice he didn't say, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until the end of the week. <laughs> tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until 5 o'clock and then the pastor's time is cut off because that's as far as we give him on Sunday to preach his message. Hello now. No, he didn't put a time frame on it. He didn't put a time frame. He said, tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He said, you wait there until something happens. You wait there until the promise of the Holy Ghost comes. Well, Lord, when's that going to be? Doesn't matter. I want you to tarry. The word tarry in the original Greek today means literally to make, to sit down, to set a point, to confer a kingdom on one. It can also mean in trans. Sensitively, <laughs> to sit down or to sit, to have fixed one's abode, to sojourn or to settle down. So, okay, Pastor, that would confuse me more than if you had just given it to me in the Greek. In other words, what the Lord was saying was, go to Jerusalem and get comfortable and sit. Have no other plans. Let nothing at all disturb you or let nothing at all grab your attention away from the task at hand. Go there, Lisa, get comfortable and wait until you be endued with power from on high. Oh, I'm going to tell you, we got a problem in the church world today. This old preacher, I grew up old-time Pentecost. I got news for you, honey. Straight, gay, cross, and or blind, I'm still old-time Pentecost. You, don't you think for a minute I ain't, because I am. That's why we don't have more people in church today, because I got too much old-time Pentecost in me for some folks liking. But I'm going to tell you, I remember when I was a kid, you go to church, if somebody, you know, I grew up in an area where it was a lot of Catholic folk, you know. And uh, sometimes they'd say to me, well, what time does your service end? And I'd look at them and say, I don't know. <laughs> where well, I don't know. Our service ends when it ends. You Pentecostal people are weird. I can't tell you, Martin, we start serve, service at 11 o'clock and we finish at 1230. I can't do that. I cannot tell you that. Why? Because the move of God might come. Because we might have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We might have things happen. We might have miracles. We might have uh, an altar call that lasts for hours. We might be in church from 11 o'clock until 6 that afternoon. We might go to church on Sunday night at 7, and we might not get out of there till 2 or 3 in the morning. I've been in many services like that, folks. Many. You know why? Because when I was a kid, you went to church and tarried. You went to church, and all you were focused on was... Lord, make yourself real. Reveal yourself to us. Oh, God, let your power be manifest in this place. You didn't have any other plans. You didn't have nothing else more important to do. All you wanted to do was be in the presence of God and let God do what God was going to do. Amen. Seriously, I'm not joking. We... I, I literally, growing up as a kid, if somebody asked me, what time does your service end? I would always tell them, we don't know. It, it ends when God's done. That, that's literally how I used to answer people. Because that's how we believed. We've got a clock in our sanctuary. Let me tell you something. This old preacher, that's sacrilege. We didn't used to have clocks in our sanctuary. Because a clock meant you were putting God on a timetable. You didn't want people in the sanctuary turning around, looking at the clock all the time. Is this preacher ever going to get done? 
<laughs> When's he going to finish this message? My God. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. I know there are preachers who take their liberties and they talk forever and then they call it God. No, going forever does not constitute God. But being open to God means I'm willing to go forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to be here until God moves. Hallelujah. I'm willing to be here until God does something. The Lord said, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power, not until 5 o'clock. Amen. Tarry in the house of God until your soul is blessed, until you've heard from the Lord, until you're empowered by God. Hallelujah! What a mindset to come into the house of God with. Lord, I'm going to church. Ooh, I'll tell you, growing up as a kid, I saw so many miracles. I'm not kidding. I saw so many miracles. I went to church every Sunday. And I mean, I was just like a kid in a candy store. I'm sitting there just waiting to see what was going to happen. Oh, is somebody going to get the Holy Ghost today? I love to see somebody get the Holy Ghost. Is God going to knock my great grandma on her back? Is he going to lay her out on the floor today? And she'll be laying there for three hours while the whole service goes on, only to get up and only be able to say, He was beautiful. He was beautiful. He was beautiful. Somebody has to lead her to the car and put her in the car. As my great grandmother says, he was beautiful. He was beautiful. She was on that floor for hours, slain in the spirit. So touched by the power of God, she couldn't even keep her legs underneath her. And during that time, she saw the Lord. And all she could say, literally, folks, I'm not kidding, for hours was, he was beautiful. Wouldn't you love to have an experience like that? Wouldn't you love to be able to have a vision of Jesus and to see him in his power and in his glory, in his uh, divine, with his divine diadem in his hand? Wouldn't you love to experience that and to be able to Open your eyes and realize, oh my Lord, I'm still here on planet Earth. And yet the only words you can get to come out of your mouth, he was beautiful. He was beautiful. But see, back in the day when we went to the house of God, we had no other plans. You got settled into your seat. I'm going to tell you, the church I grew up in, we didn't have no padded pews either. We had pews with a pad. But if you've ever sat on a pew with a pad, you know the little skinny pads they used to put on the pew, you know? <laughs> Honey, they hurt your hymie. <laughs> and they had little buttons in them. Now, why somebody button tucked those things, I'll never understand. Because that button tucked and didn't make it any more comfortable by a long stretch. You went home with a rear end that looked like some kind of a road map. All because you were sitting on this button tufted uh, padding on the pew. It wasn't altogether comfortable. We didn't have padding on the back, Martin. Just had wood. Just had wood. And you know what? I love every minute, every memory I have in that little church I grew up in. I kid you not. Every single memory I have in that church I cherish and I value and I love every minute of it. And I remember services when the power of God came down in that building so wonderfully, so amazingly, that literally, this is long before Benny Hinn turned it into a dog and pony show. Long before it became a dog and pony show. And I remember people literally just littering the entire front of our sanctuary slain in the spirit by the power of God. And it wasn't, oh, you're slain this man. Get up and, and you go down again. Get up. Oh, and you go down again. No, 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 no. Those people went down and the pastor, we'd have worship service, we'd sing, we'd preach, we'd have altar call, and they'd be down there the entire time. Mm -hmm. The entire time. If they were sick when they went down, they were healed when they got up. If they didn't have the Holy Ghost when they went down, they had the Holy Ghost when they came up. 
if they were a drunk and an addict when they went down, they were not when they got up. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, that's back in the day when God was doing it and not men trying to act like God was doing something. No, real things happened. When people were slain, real things happened. People who were going through struggles and trials and were wrestling with temptation and were wrestling with difficult circumstances, they would get up from that experience. And during that time, God would have given them a revelation, an understanding of something that would encourage them, Stephanie, that would give them direction, that would help them to face that circumstance head on, all of a sudden, they were no more troubled by the fact that their child was addicted to drugs. They were no more troubled that they had a husband who abused them. Because during that time, God gave them a revelation and an understanding. He spoke to their heart and said, I'm going to take care of this mess. Don't you worry about that. And guess what? By the time it was all done, he did. We don't get settled in anymore. We don't get comfortable. We don't wait on God. We wait on the clock. We don't wait on God. We wait for the next appointment. I told Tommy to this week, I think it was yesterday, the day before, I said, oh, God's given me such a wonderful message, such a powerful message for this Sunday. I said, I'm so excited to preach it. Guess what he said? As long as you keep it under 30 minutes. <laughs> I said, you just made my point. You just made my point. <laughs> you just made my point. That's exactly what I'm talking about. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the word of God reads, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled. All filled, including Mother Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was in that room. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Got news for you, honey. She was no more divine, no more perfect, no more holy than you and I today. She was chosen vessel of God, but she still needed the Holy Ghost. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them a trance. The Lord could have said to them, tarry ye in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost. Why didn't he? Why didn't he put a time frame on it instead of telling them, just wait for this experience. Wait for this event. Have you ever sat in a waiting room while a friend or a daughter or granddaughter was having a baby? And you're just sitting there waiting. You ain't going nowhere. You're not going, no, 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 no. You done made up your mind before you ever walked into that waiting room. I'm going to be here till that baby is born. If my kid or my granddaughter is in labor, and my friend is in labor for 24 hours, and I'll just make myself a bed right out here on these chairs, and I'll sleep, but I'm going to be here when that baby's born. I'm going to be here when that doctor comes out and says, it's a boy, it's a girl. Some of y'all say, are you that old? Yep. We had to wait till the kid popped out before they could tell you whether it's a boy or a girl. Now they can tell you before it's conceived. <laughs> Come on, honey, let's go. We're going to have a boy. No. <laughs> you ever been in a place like that? Oh, yeah. You ever been a loved one who was in surgery? They were being operated on, and the outcome was not guaranteed. Maybe the outcome was guaranteed. Maybe. Maybe the doctors told you in advance, everything will be all right. This is, this is pretty routine. But you waited 
outside that surgical room and you had no other plans. You were perfectly content to sit there and wait. You didn't like waiting. Who likes waiting? I don't like it. If there's anything in the world I hate, it's waiting. Forget Tommy. Forget Tommy. We ain't even going to talk about that. Every intersection he pulls up to, I'm going to tell you, if there's one car in that intersection going straight, he's making a right-hand turn. Because he ain't going to sit there and wait. I said, Booby, what in the world is wrong with you? Can you not get behind somebody and just sit and wait for a minute till the light turns green? No, I can make a right, go 30 miles out of my way and come back around. But at least I'll be home. <laughs> That's somebody with patience, let me tell you. But have you ever been in a place where you had a loved one in that surgery in that room and you're waiting? You're tarrying. You make yourself comfortable. You, you have it in your mind, I'm going to be here until the event happens. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? I'm going to be here until the thing I'm waiting on occurs. Short of that, I'm not going anywhere. How many times has... An individual, a loved one, been in an accident and they're laying in a hospital bed at ICU and they're not conscious. And mom or dad or husband or wife or partner comes and they're standing beside them and the doctor says, you know, go home, get some sleep, get something to eat. We'll let you know when they're better. We'll let you know when they're, they come too. And Johnny, you say, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm going to tarry a while. Hello now. See, I couldn't sleep if I wanted to as long as I know this individual's not awake. I couldn't eat a thing. If I, if I wanted to, I couldn't eat anything until I know this person is okay. Do you understand what I'm telling you? See, it's all about importance. It's all about priorities. Part of the problem with believers today is God is no longer important. Our walk with God is no longer important. Our relationship with God is no longer important. It no longer occupies that same level of priority it once occupied. That's why we go to church and we stare at our watch the whole time. When are we going to get to Denny's? When are we going to get to Denny's? Maybe I can get on my phone and I'll get on their app and I'll order my pancakes so when I get there, they'll be ready because God knows I don't want to wait. You understand what I'm saying today? Folks, the art of tarrying is a long lost art. People of God no longer understand the need to tarry, to wait, to settle in. We live today in a constant state of hurriedness. Everywhere we go, everything we do, we try to do it as quickly as we can. I know about you all, but that's how I live. Everything I do, I try to do as quickly as I can. The only time we actually go somewhere and settle down and make up our mind that we're there and we're not going to allow ourselves to be subject to the constraints of time is when something of a grave, serious, or priority nature demands that we do so. That's the only time we really know how to tarry. We get home from a long and tiring day, Martin, and we settle in on the sofa, remove our shoes, take off our socks, watch as our loved one passes out. No. <laughs> Pull off our socks. We're determined that nothing is going to make us get up and leave the house again that day. You ever been there? Yes. I mean to tell you, I'm home and I won't be home. I'm home and I'm staying home. I ain't going to go nowhere till I have to go somewhere. Yes, sir. We get snuggled up beside our spouse. We enjoy their warmth, their affection. We're determined that nothing short of a nuclear bomb will move us from this, our favorite place in all the world. Am I the only person who feels that way? No. no. A loved one goes into surgery, and we settle in the hospital waiting room, make ourselves as comfortable as we can, but we're determined we're going to wait for that surgery to end. We're going to wait for that doctor to come and tell us that all is well. There was a time in the Pentecostal church when people came to the house of God to tarry. 
We wouldn't even allow a clock on the wall in the sanctuary. We settled into our seat and we waited on the Lord, hoping and praying for a move of God, begging the Lord to save some lost soul, to fill some new believer with the Holy Ghost, to heal some sick body from their sickness or disease, or to deliver some bound victim from their oppression and the chains of bondage, addiction, or spiritual paralysis. But today, we're in such a hurry. We go to church with plans already made for what will come after the service. We have a time established in our minds that we're confident the service will be over by. <laughs> Long past are the days when God's people went to church and could only answer someone who inquired as to when the service might end. We never know. <laughs> it depends entirely upon what God does and how God does it. In Acts chapter 20, verse number 7 through 12, the word of God reads, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Woohoo! Let me preach till midnight, and let's see how many of y'all are sitting here. I guarantee even Tommy would be gone. <laughs> of course, I'd be headed to the divorce lawyer, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Ain't nobody want to sit and listen to me preach for the next six, seven hours. I'm pretty sure of that. Paul sat there and preached till midnight, folks. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eulichus. Eutychus, I'm sorry, being fallen into a deep sleep. Well, I'm glad to know Paul's had folk go to sleep on him, too. I'm not the only one. He had his Tammy. He had his Rose. <laughs> I'll tell you, my challenge was to see if I could do a whole Sunday and keep Tammy awake or keep Rose awake, you know. And here this young man falls asleep. Listen now. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft. Wow, third story. And was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed, and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. You need God to do something for you today. You would really need the Lord to do something for you today. Why don't you tarry? You need the Holy Ghost. You need a healing. You need a miracle in your life. You need something. Why don't you tarry? Why don't you settle down and get comfortable and wait a while? I'm going to tell you a little secret. The longer you're in God's presence, the more likely you are to get your miracle. Hello now. The longer you're in God's presence, the more likely you are to get what? you need. I wonder how many people that afternoon sat for hours and hours listening to the Lord Jesus Christ preach in the wilderness. You remember there were 5,000 men plus women and children. A lot of people. And they sat there and they listened to the Lord preach and teach. And the Bible said after a period of time the Lord recognized these folks got to be hungry. These people have got to be hungry. You can't be here this amount of time and be hungry. He said, why don't you feed them? He said, Lord, what in the world are you talking about? What kind of food do we have to feed all this many people? 
You remember the miracle of the feeding of the, they call it the feeding of the 5,000, but there were just 5,000 men because all they ever counted were men because men That's were the right. only thing that was important. No, just made counting easier. <laughs> and you had your, you'd always say 5,000 men plus women and children. So you could easily triple that number, folks, quadruple that number. But I wonder how many people in that audience, before the Lord realized, hey, these people must be hungry. I wonder how many of those people said, man, I'm getting hungry. He's just talking. I'm going home. I'm going to give me some to eat. <laughs> and they left. And they went home, and they heated up their Campbell soup. They made themselves a grilled cheese. And they sit down and they munched and they sat there and they were so sad. Oh, now I'm satisfied. Now my belly's satisfied. Now I feel better. I've eaten. Oh, you poor thing. If only you'd have tarried, you'd have been part of a miracle. If only you'd tarried, you'd have been part of a miracle. If only you'd tarried, you'd have had a meal that God himself provided for you. Hello now. Do you hear what I'm telling you? If only you'd tarry, God would have met your need instead of you trying to meet it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. How many times we run around trying to meet our own needs? We try to do what we need to do for ourselves, and God is saying, why don't you just sit down a while? Mm -hmm. You remember what the Word of God said in prophecy in the Old Testament? The Lord told his people, he said, stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. He said, you know, why don't you just tarry a while? Let me take care of this. Oh, folks, I'm going to tell you, we fight a lot of battles. We go through a lot of troubles. We experience a lot of things that we don't have to experience and we don't have to go through. A lot of battles we don't have to fight if we would just learn to carry. Get in front of God and stay there. You remember old Jacob? He wrestled with the angel of the Lord. He said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Said, I made up my mind, this is where I'm going to be, and I ain't moving till you bless me. He got his blessing, didn't he? Mm -hmm. You remember old Elisha, who was an apprentice, as it were, to Elijah the prophet. Mm -hmm. And Elijah had gotten word from the Holy Ghost that he was soon to be carried off to glory in a fiery chariot. And he told Elisha, he said, I'm going home shortly. God sent in a chariot to pick me up. Why don't you stay here? What did Elisha say? Elisha said, oh, no, sir, where you're going, I'm going. And then Elijah said, well, I'm going to the next town, but you stay here. He said, oh, no, 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 sir, I'm going with you. I'm going with you. Oh, I want to tell you, people get blessed when they're willing to put in the effort and stick with it a while. There are people out there today who need the baptism of the Holy Ghost, who need God to put that power in their life that we're talking about today in our primary text. And you say, Pastor, how do I receive the Holy Ghost? Well, first of all, you need to slow down a bit. You need to find some time when you don't have plans. and you don't. Hey, I understand you're a single mom. I understand you got kids. I understand you're a parent. I understand you've got a job. I understand you've got a spouse. I'm going to tell you something. You know, we do special events every once in a while, like our fellowship conference and stuff like that. People don't understand the, the purpose of these type of events. These type of events are set up so that, listen to me now, because some of y'all are about to choke. So you can take your vacation and spend almost all day for a week in church. Pentecostal tradition, they have camp meeting twice a year. Winter camp meeting and summer camp meeting. You know what camp meeting is? That's when you go to the campground and you stay there all day, every day for a week. And they've got church morning, afternoon, and night. And you spend almost the entire day in the church house. And I mean to tell you, by the time you leave that meeting, you feel like you have sprouted wings and can fly. Because your soul is so energized and your spirit is so uplifted. Why? Because you tarried. You see, that's when people would take the opportunity to say, I'm going to set it up. I'm going to take that week off of work. That way, Martin, I could just go and be in the presence of God and just sit and not be going anywhere, not doing
anything. I'm just going to let God bring to me whatever God wants to bring to me. I'm going to let God do for me whatever God wants to do for me. I'm going to let God uh, bring miracles into my life that he wants to bring. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? That's why you do these kind of things. Some people look at us Pentecostal folk like we're out of our mind. Who wants to be in church morning, afternoon, and night for a week? Well, that's crazy. No, it's not crazy. It's wonderful. Because you get to tarry. You get to come into the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to be here for a week. I ain't got no plans. I'm just going to rest. You're seeking the Holy Ghost. You got kids? Go get Grandma. Ask her if she mind watching the kids for a while. Hello, now. How long do you want me to watch them? I'm not sure, Ma. I'm not sure. I'll let you know. But I need God to do something for me. And until I get it, I need to free myself of distractions. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? I need to free myself of distractions. I, I don't need activity. I don't need responsibilities. I need to free myself. When you make up your mind that you're going to approach things in this way, God is going to move in your life. The long lost art of tarrying. We better rediscover. We better understand today how important tarrying is. God's people have got to find that place of commitment, that level of conviction. Yes. <laughs> yeah, even my phone rings at times. That level of conviction, that status of priority that makes them enter the house of God without a predetermined time to leave. Once again, we have to learn to come before the Lord and give Him our undivided attention. Not rushing for the door, but rather rushing for the altar. Looking for the God of all creation to reveal himself, to manifest himself, to make himself real to us in ways that have never before been seen or experienced by us. What prevents us today from getting our healing or receiving the Holy Ghost? It is our inability or our unwillingness to tarry. The Lord told his disciples, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until the promise of the Father come upon you, till you be endued with power from on high. What does that mean? It means this. Stop. 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 Don't slow down. Stop. People that, well, I'll slow down for God. <laughs> He'll just jump in the car while I drive by. Uh -uh. You need to stop. Take a seat. Get settled. And wait on the Lord until something happens. Oh, children, the long lost art of tearing. You may not appreciate this message today. You might. I don't know. You may not. But I'm going to tell you the day will come when you're going to look back and remember this message. And you're going to say, you know what? Pastor Charles delivered one of the most important spiritual principles that I will ever, ever hear in my life. I can get whatever I need from God so long as I don't try to put God in a box. I can get whatever I need from God as long as I don't try to put a time frame on Him. We sang that chorus this afternoon, In His Time, In His Time. Do you know that comes right out of Scripture? That, that chorus comes right out of the Word of God. He makes all things beautiful in His time. Well, it's kind of foolish then to try to rush Him, isn't it? It's kind of foolish to try to put Him on a time constraint and say, All right, Lord, you got till 5 o'clock, move! <laughs> let's have church hallelujah let's shout and then at five o'clock we're going to make a rush for the door to go to Denny's I can't wait for the day folks I told you I'm an old time Pentecostal preacher I really am our services today are nothing like they will one day be they're nothing like they will one day be and I, I unfortunately I'm probably the only one in the room who has enough experience with Pentecost to, to know what the the, the eventual outcome is going to be. There's going to come a day, I promise you, when God is going to move in such a wonderful, powerful way to blow your mind. 
and 8 o'clock will roll around and you will have never once looked at your watch. And then things will start to wind down and all of a sudden you'll look at your watch and say, my Lord, 8 o'clock. I had no idea. I remember being at church till 2 and 3 in the morning and that very thing happening. Looked at our watch and said, oh my goodness, 2 o'clock in the morning. Had no clue. Had no clue. You remember when Peter went up on the rooftop to pray and he fell into a trance? Mm -hmm. So you just have no concept of time because you're in the Spirit. Because you're in the presence of God. You're experiencing the power of God. All of a sudden, time is the last thing in the universe that you're worried about. Say, oh, but pastor, if we don't go home until 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to work on Monday exhausted out of my... Oh, no, you won't. Let me tell you, I've been there many times. You go to work, honey, you feel better going to work after that kind of a church service than you do going to work after you slept 12 hours. You do. Because the Spirit of God, the presence of God, it empowers you, it inspires you, it energizes you. So today I encourage you, learn with me. I'm reminded, Lord, help me. Help me to tarry. See, there's a reason I'm closing, I promise. There's a reason I like to go up to Oklahoma and get out in the middle of the boondocks. There's a reason I want you all to be able to come out there with us sometime. And we're going to have some little getaways where we go up there and camp and all that sort of. There's a reason. There, I, it, it, you know, you might think, oh, it's just for recreation. No, it's not. You're going to get something spiritual out of that experience that you cannot get here in Dallas. You're going to get away from the hustle and the bustle and the noise. Guess what? Your cell phone won't work on the mountain. <laughs> See, now most of y'all just decided, I ain't going then. <laughs> if my cell phone ain't working, I'm not going then. But you'll be in a place. See, when I go up there by myself, I'm praying, I'm singing, I'm talking to the Lord, I'm having a good time. Stephanie can tell you, I've told you before, the Word of God said, if you got a song, sing. If you got a prayer, pray. Well, Tommy can tell you, anybody's ridden with, ridden with me in a car any distance at all, Joshua, if you're watching, he could tell you. I sing, 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 sing. I love to sing. I love to worship God. The Bible said God inhabits the praises of his people. That means when you start singing, you create a bubble around you, and God fills that bubble. Hallelujah. I love to ride in my car all by myself until Jesus gets in with me. And all he's waiting on is an invitation. Well, here's the nature of my invitation. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift you up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, I lift it up and make me whole. And while I'm driving, there's that right arm up in the air, worshiping God. People look at me like I'm crazy. I don't care. Hey, listen, if some fool can get out in the middle of the street, staggering around drunk and falling over himself and stuttering his words, then why in the world should I be embarrassed that I'm worshiping God in my car, in my space? Hello now. I'm not ashamed to worship God. I got news for you. So you don't want to ride in the car with me to Oklahoma unless you're prepared. <laughs> if you ain't prepared for that, then you better just get in your own car and follow me, okay? <laughs> Amen. Lord, help us. Do you want God to help you today to learn to tarry? Amen. Do you want to rediscover the long lost start in your life of tarrying? Then stand with me if you would. Amen. Amen.